for the sessions. So good evening and a warm welcome to the eminent speakers and enthusiastic participants for the webinar on rare disease in public health and Indian context organized by DST CPR IIC in partnership with Ashoka University. I'm Dr. Mohua Chakravarti Chaudhary, a STI policy fellow at the DST Center for Policy Research, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. I'm an honorary associate at the Institute of Public Health and a member of the WHO Collaborative Network for Rare Diseases as one of the India representatives. At DST CPR, my work is focused on understanding the rare disease landscape in India and finding possible policy interventions. We have been presenting interesting discussions on Rare Diseases Month, and this year in partnership with Ashoka University, with eminent scientists and rare disease advocate, Dr. Sudha Bhattacharya and Dr. Alok Bhattacharya, and eminent scientist, Professor Sashir Dhara, we are organizing a webinar series, and today is the first session on the very important topic, equity in representation of rare diseases in public health agenda. Rare diseases are the ones that affect a small fraction of population individually, but collectively it affects a large population. And in India, it is expected to affect 72 to 96 million people. However, despite these big numbers, until recently, rare diseases have not been showcased in any public health agenda of the country. 2021 has been a landmark year for rare diseases as India got its first revised rare disease policy and the first resolution for rare diseases was also adopted at the United Nations. At CPR, we are exploring the potential of existing policies and programs to cater to rare disease patients. In our recent publication, which came out this month uh, in the Orphanet Journal for Rare Diseases, we explored uh, the potential of national health mission in integrating rare disease management. Taking this initiative forward, in today's meeting, we have leading experts in the country to talk about the lack of representation of rare diseases in public health agenda. And we will try to explore ways to address some of the gaps. So without much ado, I will request my colleague, Dr. Pragya, to start the session. Over to you, Pragya. Thank you. Thank you, Mama, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I am Dr. Prakya Chaube, and I'm a senior associate at DST CPR IIS Bangalore. And I, along with uh, Dr. Mama, work on how to extend public health services to rare diseases. What policy interventions can we look at? And for today, I would like to start the session. And for that, I would like to invite Professor Shashidhara to give the welcome address. He is a remarkable, has a very remarkable, long and remarkable career, and his list of accomplishments is way too long for me to list on everything here. But currently, he's uh, working with at Ashoka University as professor and dean of research. So, without further ado, I would now like to request Professor Shashinara to give the welcome address. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today and representing Ashoka University, which is one of the hosts of this particular uh, meeting. Uh, so before we talk about uh, and, uh, rare diseases, I just want to touch a little bit about the policy related uh, uh, one. So it, the DST, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, DST's uh, uh, Science and Technology Policy Fellow Scheme. And it has really building the capacity for the country in this area, and uh, particularly under the leadership of Akhilesh Gupta. And among the many uh, uh, initiatives of DST uh, in the area of science and technology innovation policy is, uh, other than the postdoctoral fellows, also the setting up of centers. And one of the first such centers is in the Indian of Science Bangalore, which again has pioneered uh, many policy briefs. On, on and on diverse topics and uh, and and it's a privilege to be associated with uh, both DST and DST CPR IAC uh, to host this event. And when we talk about science and technology innovation policy, we always use the you know standard statement that all policies, publicly public health policy or public policies, should be data driven and uh, and uh, science based or evidence based. Right, and particularly when it comes to the rare diseases, there's always a problem of where is the data, right? And how much is the problem 
is this problem and how to even frame a policy on rare diseases. And many people, uh, particularly Professor Alok Bhattacharya and, and many of his colleagues have contributed a lot to understand the, the scale of the problem. And many times the word rare disease itself is uh, sort of goes against any public policy uh, agenda is simply because it's considered as rare diseases. And when you start actually looking at the data, you know, and collect and look at the data, then you realize what is the health burden at the public health level uh, because of the rare disease in this country. Right? So in that way, now we have started realizing the, the burden of rare disease in this country all over the world and most, you know, in the in Indian context, uh, you know, in a country of 1.5 billion is extreme, you know, uh, diversity both in, at the levels of genetics and the socioeconomic and geoclimatic conditions. So considering this, uh, obviously, rare diseases should be uh, on the top of the public health agenda. And, and because of it's still not ex understood much, the, the causality of many of the rare diseases, obviously, once you don't know the, the cause of the rare disease, which particular genetic lesions and so forth, it's, you know, we do also do not have an appropriate treatment for rare diseases. So that means there's some big need to research on developing new therapeutics. And all of these things uh, require that, you know, uh, the rare diseases had to be studied at a scale, uh, which has to be unprecedented, uh, considering how much work has been done so far in the last few decades. The next 10 years, you know, we should have really a, you know, an agenda where the rare disease should be at the, at the one of the major priorities. And you also have this particular conference or, uh, you know, meeting is divided into two major sessions. One is to equity and the another is the registry. Both are interlinked. Unless we have the proper registry and maintained and analyzed, we wouldn't know what's the scale of the problem, how much inequality exists in uh, understanding and treating the, this disease. And what are the, you know, uh, how to bring in equity uh, in public health uh, to rare diseases as against any other disease in the, in the country. It's about giving equity to rare disease itself. And the second is among the rare diseases also, you know, some rare diseases are given more importance compared to others without even understanding, you know, the scale of the problem. Many times it's simply because some diseases are well understood, easy to study, easy to develop a therapeutics, or maybe there are more, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, pronounced voice uh, in favor of one such kind of disease is simply because of a variety of historical reasons. Many other uh, diseases may be, you know, neglected. I think this particular meeting is, is envisaged uh, to address some of these issues and come out with uh, a policy uh, on rare disease for India uh, for the next one decade, uh, which is really critical. And the current pandemic has also emphasized the importance of public health and hopefully there is some traction and moment, momentum built in and that can be uh, used to, to promote uh, research on rare diseases and developing uh, new uh, public health policies. So with this uh, opening remarks, I, I welcome you all on behalf of our organizers and uh, over to you uh, back and who is organizing this. Anjali? Okay. And Pragya. Thank you, Professor Shashidara. Uh, thank you for that welcome note. Now I would... Yeah, your, your microphone has some problem, I think it's, it's like okay. a lot of echo. Let me, let me just... Maybe uh, uh, while... Uh, hello? Am I... Yeah. While Pragya fixes her uh, microphone, I'll just take the opportunity to welcome... Um, thank... Professor Sashidhara for the wonderful uh, welcome note and setting the tone. And I will welcome Dr. Josna Dhawan to give the keynote address. So Dr. Josna Dhawan is the CEO of, of DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance. She has over 25 years of experience in research leadership at the Center of Cellular and Molecular Biology, Hyderabad. Dr. Dhawan was also involved in the establishment of DBT's Institute for Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine in Bangalore in 2009. 
Dr. Dhawan has been the president of Indian Society for Cell Biology and the Indian Society of Developmental Biologists and was elected as a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy in 2019. We are very fortunate to have you here to give the keynote address. So ma'am, the stage is yours. Thank you, Mahua, and thank you, Shashi, and all colleagues for organizing this wonderful session. Uh, it's really a privilege to be here with you. Um, you know, there's uh, so much that needs to be done uh, in this arena, and uh, bringing all the stakeholders together in a forum like this is uh, a really important step. So I'm going to start sharing my slides, if I may. Is it visible? Yeah, now we can see. Okay, yeah, full screen mode. Great. Uh, am I in full screen mode? Okay, good. So, is there a network problem? Uh, we can see it in uh, slide mode. It's perfectly fine, ma'am. Okay, fine. Uh, sorry for that uh, little technical glitch. Um, Again, just want to thank everyone here for uh, giving me the honor of uh, giving this, this uh, lecture. It's actually been uh, an important thing for me to go back and look at the uh, issue of rare diseases uh, because as a basic cell and developmental biologist, uh, one's motivation for much of one's work comes from trying to have an impact on disease. And, uh, but often one doesn't get there. And uh, the, you know, understanding the scale of the problem at a human level is something quite different from understanding the scale of the problem at the level of cells and molecules. And I want to give our audience uh, a little flavor of that. So what I'm going to talk about today is really a bit about the biology of rare diseases and uh, the importance of active pa patient participation. Uh, being the key to discovery of new therapeutic avenues. And uh, right on the bottom of my slide, you'll see a number of organizations that are focused on uh, uh, rare diseases as a, as a cohort or more specifically on the myopathies which are close to my heart. Uh, and this is not to say that there aren't other organizations, I'm sure there are, and that they will forgive me for not uh, having had the time to pull the slides together in a fashion that uh, represents them. But I know there are others out there. So as uh, was pointed out in the initial um, talk, I mean, rare diseases are really very many in number, but they affect a large number of people as well. And although there are, you know, over 7,000 different rare diseases worldwide, uh, about three in four, 75% of them of these rare diseases are genetic in origin. So essentially understanding the genetic basis of the disease is the path to its treatment. Um, rare diseases in India, the recent national Indian policy for rare diseases has officially recognized only about 450. So there clearly is scope for uh, a greater recognition of different types of diseases. And as someone pointed out in the earlier comments, there are you know, 70 to 90 million patients in India. So this is not a small number. So collectively they represent a very large number of people who are living with disability and disease and often without hope for a treatment. So it's, it's really critical that uh, we come together to do something about this. Uh, just to point out, some of these things are uh, self-evident, but it's worth uh, setting the framework for the discussion today. And that is that a fundamental challenge in research and development for many of these diseases is that there's little known relatively about the pathophysiology or the natural history of many of these diseases. They're difficult to work on, often because the patient pool for any individual disease in one location may be quite small, which means that there's inadequate clinical experience in any one center. 
So clinical explanations for these rare diseases might be either skewed or partial. And very often, these rare diseases are chronic. So long-term follow-up is particularly important, but very often difficult to do. Patients have little access. So there's less than uh, ideal published data on long-term treatment and uh, a poor characterization over the, the life history of the disease. So there are some particular uh, challenges faced by the rare disease community in India. And that has to do with the lack of public awareness about these rare diseases, which is compounded by our social factors, uh, which lead to uh, uh, endogamy or consanguineous marriages. Uh, often there's lack of specific education among uh, med the medical community. And there are very few diagnostic centers in the country. And these diagnostics are very expensive and they take a long time. So the very few available orphan drugs uh, are prohibitively expensive. They're not made in India for the most part. And access issues are uh, compounded by lack of uh, health insurance. Um, I already spoke about the fact that there's insufficient research in rare diseases, partially because of lack of infrastructure and funding. And uh, patients lack access to clinical trials as most of them are occurring outside of India. And uh, we really need, I think, to improve the collaboration among stakeholders within India and with global engagement. So I think it's very clear that rare diseases are a global health problem. And so the solution also needs to be global. And that means that we need to work towards equity for people living with a rare disease. Uh, towards that end, the, uh, as you know, the rare disease day is on 28th February, and this has been spearheaded by the NIH and uh, with many stakeholders globally. And these cross-border collaborations are truly vital to accelerate access to life-saving therapies for rare diseases, or even towards the hope towards life-saving therapies. So I'm going to give you a, a cell and developmental biologist's perspective. And I'm going to show you here a, a picture of an iconic developmental biologist, Lewis Wolpert, who said that it's not birth, marriage, or death, but gastrulation, which is truly the most important time in your life. Okay, So gastrulation for the lay people here is a, a key event in the early life of an embryo when it's only a few cells big and during which time cell division, cell movement and cell specialization in this early little ball of cells gives rise to the embryo proper. And it's here that we understand most critically how important genes are when they're controlling development. Because as you know, many genes go awry in developmental programs that lead to rare diseases. So I, I want to shout out here for a wonderful blog that was written by Chetna Sachidanandan, who works on rare diseases by using the zebrafish as a genetic model. Uh, and what she wrote about was the, the obstacle course to being. And you know this might seem like a strange thing uh, for a scientist to be saying uh, how miraculous it is that normal births actually occur. And the fact is we have to think about the, the, the sort of bell curve of normalcy in genetics and the impact of very small changes in mutations, uh, which lead to moving individuals outside of this bell curve where uh, you have a disease uh, causing mutation, which leads to a single defect which then has multiplicative effects over uh, developmental uh, uh, time courses to lead to defects that uh, cause major problems in either a single organ system or multiple organ systems. So as you can see, uh, if you just think about uh, the continuum of life as being a network, which is integrating uh, different molecules which are controlled by genes, which integrate into cells and have to work together to make networks. These networks essentially underlie an organism. Organisms themselves form networks which create ecosystems and society. So what you're looking at is uh, defects and mutations that take place at the level of molecules and genes, uh, which have these multiplicative effects all the way up uh, to give you the disease phenotype, which has a major impact on society. 
So I'm going to spend a little bit of time focusing on the neuromuscular diseases because those are the ones that are closest to my understanding and to my work. Uh, as you know, the neuromuscular diseases themselves, and this we're just talking about, you know, two organ systems uh, compared to the rest of the body where there are so many other things, we, you know, we talked about the fact that there are 7,000 rare diseases. But if you look at the neuromuscular diseases, even they are so variable, they vary in their pattern of inheritance, the origin of the genetic mutation, their incidence, the symptoms, the age of onset and their rates of progressions and prognosis. So on, on the left, you just have a, a, a list of very partial list of some of the important uh, uh, neuromuscular disorders. But what you can see immediately when you think about the, uh, the musculoskeletal system, you have a very large and distributed uh, therapeutic target. So any uh, uh, therapeutic uh, avenue that you think of has to be something that is going to affect all of these uh, uh, cells and muscles. So it's a difficult thing to do. Um, it, this means that you have to have a, a, a systemic therapy that works uh, yeah, uh, across the body. Now I'm just gonna focus a little bit on the muscular dystrophies. Uh, there are many kinds, as I uh, suggested earlier. And what happens in muscular dystrophies is that you go from a normal uh, uh, complement of muscle to atrophy uh, and, and loss of, of muscle, as you can see in the disease condition. Now, if you look at the level of the cell, and this I'm showing you uh, is our cross sections of muscle uh, stained to uh, show the protein which is um, uh, defective in uh, some of these muscle diseases, you can see that the pathology consists of a very aberrant type of histological distribution of the muscle cells and a lot of inflammation. And uh, mutations in muscle proteins underlie these muscle diseases. And one of the important ones is the dystrophin dystroglycan complex. I don't want to get too full of jargon, uh, but I do want to just point out that a single uh, Pro, uh, a mutation in a single protein which lies at the surface of the cell and connects the nucleus to the exterior of the cell uh, via the, the, the cellular skeleton uh, is the cause for this disease. And when you have different types of mutations in different members of this whole complex, it leads to very different kinds of uh, myopathies which affect different groups of muscle. So just from a single uh, gene, when you have different um, mutations, you affect different muscles differently. And when you have mutations in different members of this whole complex, you have very different types of diseases. So you know this increases the complexity of what you're trying to uh, therapeutically correct. So now normal adult skeletal muscle can repair itself by regenerating. And what I'm showing you here is simply what happens to a muscle after it gets um, injured uh, and has uh, uh, you know, a cleanup process that the inflammatory system and the muscle stem cells perform and then regenerate uh, perfectly well. But a diseased muscle cannot sustain a repair response and it degenerates leading to pain and disease. Now, in skeletal muscle, you have stem cells which are available for normally doing this purpose. And they, these stem cells actually normally sleep uh, in the adult muscle, but are woken up by damage and repair the muscle and then go back to sleep. So in other words, waking them up is important for repairing the damaged muscle, but going back to sleep is also critical for making new stem cells. So returning to this dormancy creates the capacity for future unpredictable damage. So understanding even dormancy is an important uh, aspect of uh, uh, basic muscle biology. And it's something that my lab has been interested in for many years. But what are the outstanding issues with the potential for stem cell transplantation for the muscular dystrophies or other myopathies? So as I, uh, referred to earlier, skeletal muscle represents a very large and distributed target. So you need very large numbers of stem cells. So it's not a very practical approach with our current knowledge. 
Now, we also know that most of these inherited myopathies have very few therapeutic avenues available because they are degenerative, they're progressive, and you get irretrievable uh, pathophysiology. So can we think of ways to prevent degeneration rather than uh, fix it once it's happened? For that to happen, we need to understand the normal homeostatic repair and regeneration at a molecular and cellular level. So there are many paths to intervention, potential ones. You can modulate stem cells uh, in, in situ by systemic signals directly. Uh, using little packages like exosomes or by metabolic programming or small molecules uh, which uh, are targeted to these uh, skeletal muscle cells or by targeted RNA molecules or gene editing. And, you know, uh, speaking of which, I mean, in the, in the middle of this pandemic, one of the sort of great benefits, uh, if we can say, to have arisen out of the pandemic is the uh, absolute uh, supremacy of mRNA technology and, uh, you know, something that has been worked on for 30 years uh, suddenly found its day because uh, of the absolute urgency for mRNA-based vaccines. And use of mRNA technology may well be one of the key hopes for many of these rare diseases because they are tunable and uh, they can be used to deliver even gene editing molecules. So uh, this is uh, still a very nascent area of research, but I think is going to be something that offers great hope uh, for the targeting of different types of rare diseases. Uh, so the long-term goal of these kinds of studies, I think, is to use the endogenous regulatory pathways and networks in uh, uh, patients to reveal pathways and molecules that may actually uh, permit exogenous control either of stem cells or prevention of degeneration and the pathophysiology. So I want to spend a couple of minutes highlighting new research in muscular dystrophy in India. And this, uh, I, I'm highlighting work from Dr. Akashubra Ghosh uh, at the GROW lab in the Narayana, Netralia. Uh, my network was unstable. Am I audible? Yes, Josna, I can. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry for the interruption. But uh, just want to point out that uh, um, Aka is working on a number of different types of uh, rare diseases using uh, the approach of actually creating a wonderful platform for being able to make uh, uh, genetic therapies available. And that is, they may target everything from uh, uh, retinal diseases to muscular diseases using adeno-associated uh, uh, viruses. So the AAV lab that he has established at Narayana is really now moving to scale, and it's a, a remarkable thing that this is happening. He's generated a system of AAV vectors, which he's developed, and he's expanding these into plug-and-play delivery systems and using them in animal models. Uh, with a substantial degree of success. And what he's doing is creating a production facility, which is now operational, and uh, so that he can make sufficient amounts of these vectors to be able to start potential clinical trials. Uh, so these are just some of the technical aspects of the AAV vectors uh, that he's been able to develop. Um, and what, what he's showing you here is the sort of jigsaw puzzle plug and play type of uh, technology that he's hoping to generate. And over here is just a single result that he's shown using uh, uh, a situation where he's injected the animals in a, a, a mouse model of muscular dystrophy, the, the MDX mouse, which lacks dystrophin, and where he's showing the widespread uh, expression of dystrophin with a single injection of this uh, AAV vector carrying a mini dystrophin. He's also using adeno-associated viruses for transducing retinal layers in the mouse. And what I'm showing you here is uh, his efforts at moving towards a dedicated clinical-grade gene therapy production facility at Narayana. So, uh, 
just want to get back to the broader situation, which is that to point out uh, that patients and their families are critical in the progress towards new discoveries, uh, both from the perspective of advocating for policies that enable government and NGOs to focus on the real problems and create mechanisms for funding, and also being active participants in discovery research, not just a passive recipient of ideas that are developed for academic interest or without an understanding of the lived experiences of patients. So here I'm showing you uh, uh, Sanjana Goel, who's the founder of the IAMD. She is herself an LGMD patient. She's founded this wonderful uh, uh, facility in Solon in Himachal Pradesh. And I'm showing you pictures here of Sanjana and Sanjana with my colleague uh, from CCMB, Dr. Chandak, who runs a camp there <clears throat> every year for genetic diagnosis and uh, uh, you know, uh, palliative care of many of these muscular dystrophy uh, patients of which there are a very large number in India. So it's very clear that both basic and clinical research in rare diseases has to be collaborative and include longitudinal studies. We need to train investigators in clinical research. We have to have pilot and demonstration projects. And we also need to act, uh, we need to make sure that uh, patients, finish, physicians and the public has open access to information related to rare diseases. We need a greater patient involvement in drug development. We need natural history registries. We need uh, targeted therapies, as well as we need targeted incentives for rare disease drug development, which means that our uh, pharmaceutical and biotech industry needs to get involved in a very real way. So I'll stop there and I'll give very special thanks to Nisha Venugopal from Indo-US Rare, who helped me to in the presentation uh, and pulling together much of the information in these slides. And uh, Dr. Arka Shubra Ghosh, who was kind enough to share with me some of his work. And I'll also give a shout out to the uh, India Alliance Fellowship and Grant Awardees in Rare Diseases, of which we have several. And this, uh, in particular, the Center for Rare Disease Diagnosis funded by the India Alliance. Okay. To end with uh, thanks to my lab uh, and uh, to acknowledge all the sources of funding that have helped me in my own uh, uh, academic journey. I'm now, of course, no longer uh, uh, doing that much active research. And I also want to thank collaborators like uh, uh, um, Anna from um, the University of Paris Diderot and Alok Bhattacharya. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. So um, I think Mawa. Yeah, Anjali, please take over and start the session to the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Jyotsna, for delivering a wonderful uh, start to the session and setting up the keynote address. Thank you, ma'am, for joining us. I take it, get it. I give it Thank over to so Dr. Much. Anjali to take it over from here. Thanks. Thanks, Mawa, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Josna. I think you have already set the context for the panel discussion in a, such a wonderful way. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, uh, may I please quickly introduce myself? I am Anjali Taneja. I'm a policy scientist and I've been leading science policy initiatives at Ashoka University. Ashoka University is one of the leading uh, arts and sciences universities and uh, focuses a lot on interdisciplinary research and uh, advanced uh, research and development across a lot of fields which are very new to India and coming up in a big way. So happy to be here with all of you and taking the discussion forward to the next uh, session. Um, so now we have the panel discussion and we have four eminent panelists with our speakers. Uh, just to quickly give an overview of how we'll, we will carry out this session. Uh, it will be divided into three parts. So the first session would be addressed by each of the panelists for around eight to 10 minutes. Uh, second part of the session would be an open floor discussions on the basis among the panelists um, on the basis of 
what was discussed in the first session and accordingly we can uh, uh, discuss how we can take it forward in terms of a roadmap um, on uh, equity of rare diseases in public health agenda and the last session would be the q and a where we would uh, request the audience i think a lot of questions have already been pouring in for dr josna so i think the audience doesn't want to let you go that easily so um, uh, most of the questions we request the audience to actually put in the q a panel and um, we will take it at the end and of course if it is addressed to a specific panelist maybe you can also mention to whom it is addressed in your question and we can take it from there so without wasting any more time uh, we'll uh, move on to the first uh, part of the session where we will have addresses by the panelists and uh, please allow me to welcome very accomplished and esteemed panelists today dr prashant shrinivas dr arun singh Dr. Ratna Devi and Dr. Narendra. So uh, taking on the first um, panelist for the discussion is Dr. Prashant Srinivas. Dr. Prashant Srinivas is the Assistant Director of Research and leads the Health Equity Cluster at the Institute of Public Health Bangalore and DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance Intermediate Fellow. He has worked at the intersections of healthcare and health systems with ecological and social systems, with particular focus on health inequities and social determinants of health. His work critically examines the apparently transformative dimensions of technological solutions to health inequities with regard to addressing fundamental issues of social inequity, exclusion and governance. Dr. Prashant, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Taneja. And uh, I request, if possible, uh, if my slides can be shared. Uh, if not, uh, I can also share them. So if one of you could let me know. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And over the next 10 minutes, uh, I think uh, what I will attempt to do is uh, come from a perspective of a public health researcher, uh, somebody who, uh, who enters the rare disease uh, debate, rare disease dialogue from the perspective of Public and population health, um, and I and uh, and a bit later I'll I'll, I'll come back to uh, to this tension between the idea of uh, achieving public health goals on one hand uh, and securing uh, access to rare disease treatment for everyone on the other. Uh, I'm just pausing to check if the slides are possible to be shared. Yeah, if not, yeah, I can also we share just them. um, um sure, sure, sure. I yeah. So, sure. Yes. yes. Um, so my name is Prashant, and I'm speaking to you all uh, um, uh, from uh, from BRT Tiger Reserve. It's a, it's a, a public health research field station that uh, the Institute of Public Health Bangalore uh, set up several years back. Um, and of course, it's really uh, the amazing improvements in technology that uh, today allow me uh, to be able to do clinical and uh, research work in a small setting but also participate uh, in these kind of events from uh, such a small place. So on one hand, the, the, the power of uh, technology, the power of knowledge and the power of innovation, I think is uh, something that uh, is also uh, uh, an important uh, uh, sort of context in the rare disease landscape as well, because uh, there's so much of research and innovation happening in the rare disease space. Uh, but on the other hand, when we talk of equity, um, um, what, uh, uh, what really creates this tension I was talking about earlier is how do you how do we secure these uh, power of knowledge, power of technology, and power of innovation to everyone? Yeah? Because uh, we are talking here. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, can we not move the slide? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so because we are talking here of uh, being able to ensure health for all. You know, that's that's one of the important elements uh, of uh, equity. If we go to the next slide, I think in the um, initial uh, piece, uh, um, uh, the 2021 achievement of the uh, government of India notifying a national policy on rare disease, uh, I think was noted. And I think that's, uh, that's very important. And as you can see uh, in point number five, uh, there is this notion of equity already included in the policy, which is important and commendable. Um, and uh, I think, uh, however, we can we can try and examine what does this equity mean when when it is stated in a policy document what does it mean in terms of practice and implementation and how do we integrate it into meaningfully into our public health policies and practice um here on the left you can see the tension i was talking about earlier many of us in public health schools are taught about 
how we must choose modalities which secure greatest good for the greatest number right and this is always in tension with the fact that um, uh, you know health is a human right every single person who has an illness or a disorder uh, and if there exists a treatment or a therapeutic or a diagnostic that can change the, the their life situation they ought to be able to access it because health is a human right um and one of the ways of for me and i'll try to resolve this tension and and try to uh, dispel this myth that public health uh, and public health policies are sometimes in opposition uh, to rare disease work which is uh, i think not the case and uh, one of the ways in which uh, we can do that is through examining uh, the equity element which we will do um so with rare disease uh, one is with india the numbers and two uh, is the neglect and the neglect is not only of uh, uh the specific diseases uh, the neglect is also of the idea of rare disease itself in the policy and practice uh, scenario and third is i think the I, the understanding that equity is typically constructed as a rich poor divide and you can see that also in the national policy on rare diseases where i have underlined where equity is uh, immediately addressed as an affordability issue and we must we must keep it in mind equity is far more than uh, a rich poor divide or a matter of uh, affording therapeutics next slide please please so uh, uh, one one of the ways uh, to understand uh, equity is to immediately look at what the world health organization and various other um, uh, people call the social determinants of health and uh, uh, you can we can move to the next slide and uh, the the primary idea of social determinants of health uh, in the indian scenario is that health status and health care are already patterned they are unfairly distributed so what does that mean it means that ill health is not randomly distributed ill health see, uh, tends to accumulate much more in people who are already having a social disadvantage of one kind or another so this is something that uh, we comprehensively uh, synthesize in a recent uh, book on health inequities in india Uh, where there is of course a chapter on health inequities by socio economic position but you also have health inequities which gather unfairly by caste by uh, by uh, uh, by gender by disability and various other social vulnerabilities and these vary by state by region by uh, by district so in different districts different regions different states new and different kinds of inequities emerge which straight away Uh, positions the problem of social inequalities as a governance issue which needs to be tackled in a much more decentralized way than we are able to address uh, at a national level next slide please so uh, i will not spend too much time on this those of us in public health are very familiar with uh, with uh, the pathways through which this unfairness tends to accumulate and this is what is called as a social determinants of health framework and so and the pathway through which this uh, accumulates is the fact that um, access to resources access to um, uh, social networks uh, tend to shape uh, how people behave as much as individual choice might also play a part and the reason i i bring this up uh, especially in the rare disease dialogue is because we often tend to locate individual choice or individual behavior as a primary reason uh, or primary locus for action on social determinants whereas the 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 body of literature shows us that the locus of action also has to be at systems governance policies social networks and um, uh, and and power ultimately how who has the power to make a change and how how is this kind of power being used um, you know uh, that way next next uh, slide please um so just just to give up uh, give a give a practical uh, scenario for this um when we talk of uh, access to technologies because ultimately uh, access to therapeutics access to uh, uh, diagnostics are uh, an, an issue of access to technology and innovation and even if you see something like uh, type 1 diabetes uh, among the adivasi communities that we work uh, here uh, access to insulin is still a problem take the example of access and, and insulin as you know is a molecule discovered uh, uh, centuries ago uh, if not decades if i'm not mistaken 
and then talk about access to statins um, or second line anti hypertensives or simple antidepressant medication access to uh, we we this on the right is one of the papers we published from an indian from a district in southern karnataka where still we are struggling with access to essential medicines to be made available in a meaningful way at sub centers and uh, primary health centers we are still struggling also with the access to emergency obstetric care neonatal care essential laboratory conditions so we still have this entire unfinished agenda which the public health system is grappling with it's struggling with and there's very important reforms happening in order to distribute this in a more equitable fashion um, next slide uh, and the 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 reason to again bring this up is to not to say that rare diseases are now in competition with anemia and malnutrition but to realize that if and when rare diseases are occurring under in populations which are already socially disadvantaged that is a staggering burden and and currently as you know we do not even know what what is that burden more so among rural adivasi and various other socially disadvantaged communities because it's it's a that we are not uh, 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 quantifying at all so it's it's an unknown unknown um, uh, currently and uh, what what public health tells us is that these communities are probably going to be much more uh, having an aggravated manifestation chronicity morbidity and mortality because they already have the disadvantage of anemia malnutrition and various other uh, more uh, widely prevalent public health problems next slide Uh, another example of this is uh, for example uh, the uh, the adivasi population and sickle cell disease yeah so you have for example uh, uh, slightly um, more uh, more uh, privileged communities who are able to better advocate uh, in urban uh, areas for rare diseases and uh, be they are able to form these patient groups etc but you also have large numbers of socially disadvantaged communities who are not able to organize in a meaningful way and advocate for uh, for their rights and obtain uh, these things so one of the ways i i i posit that we we can try and address this is by looking at uh, at this as not a as uh, this not as a um, healthcare delivery issue but as a systemic issue so uh, and this we have and, and there are various frameworks i will not bother trying to explain this for example is one uh, framework uh, on uh, looking at health at a, in a systemic lens which talks about health and healthcare as an output of a la of a complex interaction uh, between various components most importantly including leadership and governance which too ought to happen in a very decentralized way as you all know in the hundreds of districts in india um, there is a very strong district administration and districts vary one to another and implementing national policies without change or adaptation and in these 600 or districts is going to be a big challenge if we do not empower districts to be able to function uh, and govern their health care and health services in a much more decentralized way next slide so uh, one example we tried in this recent publication on sickle cell disease uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which, which is heavily prevalent among many adivasi communities but also among many dalit communities for example um is uh, is to try and locate the patient um uh, or the individual who is uh, having uh, a given disease within the wider system um, um i mean without going into all of these different elements which can which have an impact on the individual life course um i point for example on the left side what is what is often gets hidden in this idea of context um where uh, the political context many adivasi communities for example are struggling with unfinished agendas related to forest rights land livelihoods employment etc so addressing sickle cell anemia among adivasi communities will then not only require diagnostics and gene therapy and uh, new innovations but will also require addressing support groups for example providing culturally appropriate clinical care in adivasi settings and a lot of these will have to have to have in at the local district it will have to happen through for example setting up registries which are located in local medical colleges it will require panchayats for example to uh, also enter into the agenda of rare disease so there's a lot of uh, uh, i mean while while i completely understand the challenges related to diagnostics therapeutics and the science component there's a huge society component there 
which requires social science engagement, which requires participatory uh, research, and which requires practice communities, clinical, nursing, and various other practice communities to form in order to address this. So um, it's, it's a very complex topic, and I know I've opened up a, a, a lot of boxes, um, but uh, given that I've taken, I've already, I think, uh, short, overshot my time, we'll go to the last slide. And um, I hope we can try and uh, uh, address uh, some of these uh, debates in, in our uh, interaction and try to see um, how, how to uh, widen uh, or expand the agenda of rare disease uh, within the public health community as well. The next slide, please. Yeah, so and, and thanks very much. And I'll, I'll take a few seconds to point out that uh, we are setting up uh, with uh, uh, as a DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance Center for training, research, and innovation in tribal health, where um, along with a speaker from the next uh, webinar, Dr. Deepa Bhatt, we are uh, setting up a registry, uh, the probably the first ever in Karnataka at the uh, government medical college for sickle cell disease and uh, two other hemoglobinopathies as one of the efforts at trying to address these among Adivasi populations. Uh, thanks a lot and back to, uh, back to the organizers. Thank you, Dr. Prashant Srinivas. That was quite insightful and interesting to know that uh, you, you are setting up a registry with, uh, you know, where Dr. Deepa Bhatt is involved, who would be a panelist in the sex next session. So uh, we look forward to more insights on this. Um, uh, we move on to our next speaker, Dr. Arun Singh. Um, Dr. Arun Singh is currently a professor of neonatology at Ames Jodhpur. And he is also the national advisor for the National Child Health Program, Rashtriya Bal Suraksha Karyakram for the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. In addition to this role, he is also the advisor to the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh on mother child health. He has played a critical role in the design and development of several child health concepts that were adopted by the Government of India. For example, he developed the concept of sick newborn care units and also developed the design for the modern labor rooms. He is also a professor and former head of the Department of Neonatology at Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research and SSMKM Hospitals. So Dr. Singh, we invite you for your talk. Thank you very much. And uh, um, is, the, is it uh, visible? One second. Uh, yes, it's visible. Yeah. Just let me take to the desk. So before I get distracted with these slides, uh, this is uh, something which I would like to say up to the discussion. So when we talk of rare disease and rare disease uh, <clears throat> has always been a debate. What would you call? What would be the prevalence? There are countries which uh, say that one in thousand uh, any, any disease which is more than one in thousand should be included in rare disease. In India, we also had this problem that if some of the issues are already being addressed, uh, should it be included in the rare disease or not? But let me tell you, then if we want to take the first step in this country, of talking of rare disease, one of the essentialities which come out that whatever may be the therapy If a rare disease, if a genetic problem or some problem has occurred in a newborn, there is no debate that early screening and diagnosis would give you better results. So the same problem if discovered by the parents, let's say two years later, three years later, it becomes difficult. I know some of the Rare diseases may not manifest in the newborn period. They manifest later on. So at least up to the age of six years, there should be screening. Now, when we talk of screening, uh, we talk of a Western model of screening. So someone is interested, let's say, in uh, muscle disorders. So they would say, okay, we set up and we start screening for muscle disorders. Now, for a moment, I would ask all the audience to think, if you are a parent of a child and uh, one group came and said, we want to screen for muscle disorders, early muscle disorders, 
because of course when it is very put, imminent then the parents will bring the case to you so they say okay they invite you to the home you go through it you may or may not find someone the next day another person comes and say well i am interested in rare diseases of hearing related to hearing ability so i am going to test your child for hearing the third day someone would come i am interested in homocystinuria which may affect the vision so i am interested in that now after a point of time you just can't go on screening for each and every rare disease so we came to an understanding that screening has to be comprehensive screening has to be done by a generalist management has to be done by a specialist we can't create a system in which since i am interested in let's say in down syndrome or in some other syndrome i will screen only for that collect the data for that that forms a good paper but that is not feasible in a country or uh, even with countries with lower population forget when we have a population of 1.4 billion so the point which i am quickly trying to make number one challenge is you need to screen and when you screen you screen every child which doesn't look to be a normal there are a lot of times when it is very difficult to assign a particular disease because it's a developing brain there are a lot of metabolism which has not been tested so you have to wait but if you can understand that this child is deviating from the normal then that child should be under the radar so that uh, a the main diagnosis can be made and b uh, the investigations can be carried out and if some management is already existing which is good it can be done the simplest mechanism i would say congenital hypothyroidism now some of you may include it in rare disease or not but let's understand that congenital hypothyroidism is 1 in 1200 when icmr did a study at five places for all newborns the debate was should we wait for the symptoms to appear and then screen or should we do a universal screen and it was found that by the time you allow the symptoms to come what we are classically taught as clinical features of hypothyroidism and by the time the parents think that there's some problem with my child you can still treat the child but the i the cognition which you have lost can never return back hi uh, sorry dr saying for the intervention are the slides like moving are you moving the slides or we are on the first slide we are on the first slide okay sorry so i'll just complete it quickly so before i move on so my first challenge as i said was in case of congenital hypothyroidism by the time you do selective screening that means children have some feature and then they come to a doctor and then you screen you have lost the iq points which with whatever treatment you are not going to get back so that child will remain handicapped so with the best of the effort he will improve but will not become a normal child but if the same child could be screened at birth that child would be like you and me and that's very important for any homo sapien because cognition is very important for a family for a society and for a country the next thing is okay now we screen the second million dollar question is who confirms it where does it get confirmed and the third is where will it be managed and even if there is let's say a management which is still not uh, uh, the government cannot claim that uh, this is a standard of management but there's some hope to the parent it is still a trial medicine can it be allowed it's very costly now all these are very important for the parent that child is very important and he's wanting to give it a trial with a medicine which is Uh, still not the standard care uh, for the government it is very difficult if something goes wrong how to defend it whether whether that uh, so but 
we were just talking of screening for sickle cell anemia. Now here I have a question. Why do we want to not screen for entire hemoglobinopathies of newborn? People have questioned that it's not possible to screen for thalassemia in a newborn, especially for trait. It is possible. And there are countries which are doing it. They call it screening for hemoglobinopathies because in Bengal, in Bihar, in Orissa, there could be a combination of one parent having beta thalassemia, the other having thalassemia E, but the combination would be a major disease though, uh, you could argue that only one parent had beta thalassemia, so why should the child present features of major thalassemia? So what I'm trying to say individually, these hemoglobinopathies may act. So tomorrow there's a paper which shows that there's a population which may have both one parent is sickle and one parent is thalassemia, carrier. So this combinations is going to occur as our society is going to mix up further. This thinking that sickle cell only remains in tribals could be partially correct at a particular time, but may not be correct in the longer picture. Hence, the RBSK program, which in 2012 was, was called to develop it, thought that why don't we first and foremost screen every child who is born in this country with simple tools and that screening must be done by a generalist. That means even a nurse can screen. So one, I will take you very quickly to this journey of uh, the comprehensive screening, which basically the whole RBSK sees any child with any problem, either it relates to defect at birth or it is some deficiency. Remember some deficiencies can also present as rare diseases or it is a disease per se, or there is a developmental delay and disability. So the four Ds. And it, what the learning was that in some of the countries, they screened only at birth. In some countries, they did prenatal screening. But if you want to know the burden of the rare diseases, then your screening must start from the antenatal period till six years because this slide shows you that if you're only going to screen in the first week, you're going to pick up only 60% of the major birth defects. Some of them could be rare diseases. So it's about 3%, but it could be more depending upon places. Now, India is not a country, it is a subcontinent. So there would be places where one particular disorder may be far more as compared to the other. So that diversity has to be kept in mind and the screening program has to change depending upon what is it that would be commoner even among the rare diseases and where we have a treatment which exists and can be given early. So this is the program which right now the government wants to envisage that all newborn at delivery point, you screen. Now, if you have no money, at least do a visible screening from head to toe. If you have still some money, do a visible screening do a vision screening, do a hearing screening, do a heart screening. Now, combination of this could come in various syndromes. If you still have more money, take a drop of blood, do a metabolic screening, and in metabolic, the first preference should be for hemoglobinopathies, and then the inborn error of metabolism, the commonest one being congenital hypothyroidism and congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Supposing, you still miss it. The child behaved absolutely normal. The next screening is from birth to six weeks. That is by the ASHA. And we have developed a very simple picture that you understand whether the child is behaving normally or not. We don't want a label from ASHA. It's just that this child looks different. Then there's a dedicated team from six weeks to six years, which is known as the RBSK mobile health team, which is supposed to go to every uh, Anganwadi Center, and uh, in each block, there are a four member team of two. This is for the first time anywhere in the world, you had such a comprehensive program that at various levels of screening, and you had a dedicated mobile team, which did not, we did not use the resources of a specialist doctor. We allowed the screening to be done by doctors who, who, who would uh, 
who are not supposed to manage. So we removed the dentist from there and we said the dental screening can be done uh, by, by a generalist. So, and once it is screened, uh, it will go to a center known as the early intervention center, which is linked to the newborn care and uh, in a moment, and then all the interventions whether surgical, medical or therapeutic will be done free of cost and each state, each district can decide on the priority to which it is done. So now this definition nowhere in the, so the world doesn't see it this way. In fact, the visible birth defect are sometimes known as congenital anomalies. So we simplified it. We didn't follow the Western world. We simplified it that any defect at birth, which may present at birth or which is related to birth, but comes later on will be a birth defect. And this could be visible, that is what you can see, like club foot, like et cetera. You can do the functional, you do the screening for vision, hearing and heart disease. There's a metabolic, you take a drop of blood, you send it for IEM, routine screening, specialized screening, like tandem mass spectrometry and GCMS, or a neurological screening where you find that the child is not behaving normally. So these, the four parameters, totally make a birth defect. And even if that defect appear, comes later on, that should be added in the registry when the child was born and the state and the district to which that birth belonged. So that we have a denominator. So many children were born, let's say five years back, but this child though diagnosed later, the data should go to that particular year where he was there. So this is the visible, the functional, the metabolic, the chromosomal and the neuromotor and how we are going to do. Now, I will not take you much time, but as I told you, it all depends. The visible birth defect is something which can be done at zero cost just by giving a training, which is a one and a half day training. So one may argue, am I going to pick up myopathies? Yes, you're going to pick up myopathies even by this method because we have multiple levels of screening. If there are some myopathies which can be very visible in terms of movements right at the birth, some you are going to examine if it is related, some you are going to take the blood. You can even keep the blood for later on, more studies research and the neuro development. So how will it the process flow? At early delivery point, you train a nurse and that training can be given at least with a pictorial tool, she can record. So there's a software. So in a good centers, all medical colleges, all delivery points where you receive the child, you wash your hands and do the screening. And if you have further equipments for functional screening, nowadays very simple equipments for hearing and vision is there. I'm not saying that you will come to a diagnosis of a rare disease, but at least in your radar, you will have children who are not behaving in the normal way. So most likely all your diagnoses are going to come from this group. So these are the instruments which we are supporting through RBSK. And this is being given to every district and even a sub-district if a state would like to. So you have an automated beta which can be operated by a nurse. You don't require a specialized training. Uh, just to tell you for congenital heart disease, Kerala, they did it wonderfully. Kerala IMR in 2001 was 11, and in 2017, after 17 years, was still powering around 10 and 11. The biggest debate is how could Kerala bring its IMR to a single digit? That means you had to do more than what you were doing. And one of the ways in which their health minister and the health secretary agreed because I was a part of that discussion that we are going to screen, not only screen, there should be a software which should tell me that this is a serious child. He has been screened in some tribal area so we can arrange the movement of the child and the child survives. See the beauty today in 2022, their IMR has come down. What didn't come down for 17 years has now 7.5. So it shows that even from a public health approach, it's not only a human care and people only talk of statistics, it's statistically possible if we do a good job to bring down the mortality rate. Yes, what they did is the screening was linked with management. 
So these are just the tools. Now this is the posture. And you can see the posture contains head and spine, eyes, ears, mouth and lips. So we are not putting a diagnosis. We are not saying, okay, this is anything. So you may have a club foot with a myopathy, but that is later on. At least that child should be screened and should be sent to some place. So screening is very essential when we talk and screening should be universal. You are not screening for rare diseases. You are screening for anything which looks not normal. And then among that, you keep on your spending. It. So at least, yeah. So now the question was that when you are screening it, which one requires urgent attention? So we divided our screening into those which requires urgent attention within 24 hours, those which require attention in seven days, and those. So we divided the whole thing by color coding them. Urgent, semi-urgent, and routine, and this. Now there was a, 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 when we were students, we didn't have an atlas. So this atlas of the birth defects was there. And this atlas, the pictures will come from whosoever contributing from our own country. So there could be some which the atlas does not contain, but this can kept be added. So we shared it with all the states and we said, this is just a baseline. If you are having more of these problems, why don't you put it up? Because that would be very interesting and that would be. So then there are forms how to capture the eye problems the, and how to screen them, the ear problems, and then you have the heart problems, the neurological problems, the, and then you say, okay, I would like to do a karyotyping. I would like to do something more. You at least come to a point where you justify that that money which is spent is actually going to relate. And you have a clinical picture. Often when you uh, talk to, in Bangalore, you talk to Dr. Rita Kastavara is now retired. She would always say, where is the clinical picture? How did the child present at birth? You are giving me a blood, I'm getting a metabolic problem, or I did a gene study, there's a gene for a defect. Now here I would like to be very, very important. A lot of doctors are making their diagnosis based on genotype, because now it is easy by spending money to get a microarray. I would say that the phenotype is equally important. I may have a gene for a particular disorder, autism, that doesn't mean I have autism. Till the phenotype, is presenting with autism. So sometimes genotypic. So the phenotype needs to be documented and there is a value for it. We can't have genotypic screening for the gene screening for everyone. But if I know the association between a particular feature, then I can utilize this tool by looking. That's what is clinical uh, or science or what we call the, the, the observational science, which needs to be linked. So here comes the blood. And in Kerala also, they are doing the blood spots and this blood spots. So you can do GCMS, you can do TMS, you can form a group uh, on a drop. Now, I had a question. Why can't hemoglobinopathy is done from one of the samples of this? From the same sample in which congenital hypothyroidism is picked. This will add a value because at least even in a, if I can diagnose a sickle cell anemia at birth, I can change the... I can give him profile access better, even if I can arrange for a BMT, the cost will be much easier before a phenotypic defect has come. So when they started screening it, I'm just going to show you district-wise Kerala's picture, how every day life they had, how many children born, how many children screened for positivity, and uh, the red ones were which were urgently, the semi-urgent routine and warning and this is there and the appropriate referral. Now, once after the newborn, they can still have to be screening. So we decided 30, now it has come up to 60. Each state can change. So it has again a problem. And once you have screened, then there is something in the government sector. So I'll just very quickly take you to a center which was developed in Noida, a super specialty government hospital. When we ask the space to the director, kindly give us a space, we are going to design an early intervention center where any such child which has a problem be brought. The answer, he said, I have no space. Later on, since it was a government sector, he gave a space which was parents waiting space. That too on a third floor with a very narrow uh, staircase. Now I'm going to give you the picture 
of that. Dr. Uh, Singh, uh, sorry for the intervention. We are losing on time here. Uh, could you please wrap up if possible? So I think we stop here and you can see the pictures later. Carry on. But right. before I close, there are three things which I would say. In India, rare diseases have to be understood that we may not understand the pathophysiology, but we are creating our own problems. You see, there's hardly any regulation on in infertility. The IVF has come up in a big way. All Cochrane reviews are showing that, and it makes sense that there are more uh, uh, diseases, uh, metabolic diseases, etc., chromosomal diseases in the IVF. Now you see, we have tweaked even the infertility definition. So this is a public health. If people are listening to me, please put up this. When we were students, if a girl was married and did not have a child for at least five years, then it was said at infertility. Now that definition has been changed to one year. When I question WHO, that one year means how many people, if they try for a child, they know about ovulation. What is the percentage which will conceive in the first year? The answer is 80 to 85 percent. Now, 15 percent of children, 15 percent of women, sorry, are being labeled as infertile, and they visit a doctor. They are given drugs which increase ovulation. That's going against the science. Had nothing been done, they would have waited for one more year. Statistics shows that at least 50 percent of them would have conceived by its own. The same thing is during delivery. We are rushing through deliveries. What was supposed to be taken in 24 hours, we are rushing to it without understanding the problems. We want quick deliveries. We are questioning the nature, that nature is a big fool, that for 40 centimeter distance, it wants to cover more than 24 hours. This approach is creating problems and then trying to solve. So while on one side, we have to solve the problems. We have to also change ourselves to what is known, follow the nature and try to prevent. If a mother and child is brought together, a lot of problems can be there. So there's less time to explain. But for a common man, I would say, we need to ponder that with our resources in such a huge country, can we do something to prevent a rare disease? At least if we don't know, follow the norms which are closer to nature more scientific rather than using technology to rush and trying to change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Singh. That was quite enlightening and thought provoking actually. Uh, the last message that you said, follow the norms that are more scientific is actually very, very important. And uh, your message also on like the case study that you gave on Kerala, we're reading to reduce infant mortality rate. It's actually an example that other states can actually also learn in India. Moving on uh, quickly to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ratna Devi. Um, so, uh, uh, just quickly giving a brief bio about Dr. Devi, Dr. Ratna Devi. Dr. Ratna Devi has over 30 years of experience as a medical doctor, public health and management professional working to improve health outcomes in India. She is the chair of International Alliance of Patients Organizations, a global alliance that promotes patient-centered health care. Dr. Devi is also the CEO and co-founder of Daksham A Health and education, an organization that is dedicated to working for access to health, patient education, and advocacy. She also holds the expert position among the panel of experts at WHO Collaborative Global Network for Rare Diseases, among other several offices that she holds. So great. Uh, we welcome Dr. De Dr. Retna Devi, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you to the organizers. Uh, for uh, allowing me to speak on a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, as has been said already, um, I am a doctor by profession, trained in public health, but today I will be wearing the hat of uh, a patient representative and a patient advocate and speaking uh, on equity and representation of rare diseases in public health agenda from the lens of the patients and the patient groups that are working in our country. So moving forward, 
so I do not have any declaration of interest and uh, some of those positions have already been uh, uh, you know, in, given in my introduction. Um, I would like just like to highlight a little bit that a lot of my work is with WHO, not only for rare diseases, but also for non-communicable diseases. And uh, some of the work that I do in non-communicable diseases is far more advanced than the work that I do in rare diseases. And the um, expression of the lived experience and the involvement of people with lived experience in non-communicable diseases is far more advanced because there is more representation in that particular area. Not to say that uh, the representation in rare diseases is less, but uh, it is just picking up now and there needs to be a lot more work done and hopefully in countries like ours where uh, the representation of the voice is not as defined or as structured as it is in some of the developed countries and some of the more um, advanced countries or economies, um, hopefully in the future that, that uh, representation will become much better. So I would just like to start with a quote which says, when health is concerned, equity is a matter of life and death. So we cannot talk about equity without talking about a fundamental right to health and also the difference that it makes uh, in, in a person living or dying. And this is a quote that I picked up from the former WHO Director General, Dr. Margaret Chan. In the beginning of this panel discussion, uh, we heard that uh, in public health agenda talks of health for all uh, in a culturally appropriate manner, uh, which is uh, acceptable to people. I would just change that definition a little bit and say that it is not just health for all, but health in all. Health for all means that uh, there is a, a top-down mechanism where somebody at the policy level is trying to decide who deserves what and how it is delivered. But health in all meaning means that irrespective of where you are and what your uh, condition is, it is available to you beyond the real, realm of health. So a, a person is not a sum total of his disease and the treatment that is available. A person is a human being and a human being lives and breathes. So it is not just about reaching a hospital and getting a diagnosis or getting a treatment. It is about living in your environment. It is about living in your house. It is about going to school for a child. It is about going to a workplace for a person who has lived through that particular condition. And when we talk of public health, are we really looking at it from the lens of health in all? I don't think so. So equity is the absence of avoidable, unfair, or remedial differences among groups of people, whether these people uh, groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, or geographically, or by other means of stratification. And health equity also means that everyone has a fair opportunity to live a long and healthy life. And a fair opportunity to live a long and healthy life means that you look at health or public health beyond the lens of just healthcare, but um, as a societal well being in all. And these are some of the structures that we think, um, that I think should be um, looked at for improving health equity which is building infrastructure to support health equity. And this is not just hospitals and diagnostic centers. Address the multiple determinants of health, and this was already alluded to by some of the previous speakers. Eliminate racism and other forms of oppression. And these are some of the social determinants that uh, were alluded to again. And part partner with the community to improve health equity, which means uh, listening to the lived experience, not only in terms of access to diagnosis, treatment, et cetera, but also other parameters that help them to access these services and make health equity a strategic priority, which currently is not the case. So my topic today is rare diseases, disadvantaged and left out. And I have very thoughtfully put this uh, you know, heading to my slide. Because as we said, it is difficult to diagnose. So even if we do have a diagnosis, do we have the means for the patients to reach the diagnostic centers to be able to wait with dignity and then access that diagnosis? So when we talk of lack of access, it's not just about paying for that uh, diagnosis, but being able to understand that there is a diagnostic facility available for that particular condition, having that awareness that going to that diagnostic center might help them to be uh, able to reach some kind of uh, decision making and then reach that diagnostic center from maybe a rural area or from a tier one, a tier two or a tier three city, and then be able to wait in that 
So just to give you an example, if a child is on a BiPAP machine or on a wheelchair, is that diagnostic center wheelchair accessible or does it have the facility for a person who is not able to sit or stand uh, to be able to wait there? I don't think we think about all these things at all when we talk of difficulty in diagnosis. Similarly, difficult to treat. Um, do people have enough information about where these treatment facilities are available? And we'll, if we look at the national public health agenda, then we do have a national policy for rare diseases and uh, we do have centers of excellence, but how many people actually know about this? Um, it, even if you went to the um, public health community, the doctors, I don't think medical colleges actually talk about this or uh, this is discussed beyond the clinicians. The clinicians are the one who are aware of this, but within the medical fraternity itself, or even the paramedical staff, this information is not available. So do we need a public health campaign that will actually percolate this information to not only the general public, but also to the experts who are able to treat or able to at least give the advice for treatment or uh, follow up for the people who need these kind of services. We also talked about lack of scientific knowledge. Uh, again, this is a sum total of several factors. There is lack of investment, there is lack of motivation, there is lack of several other factors. And because this uh, scientific knowledge is so restricted, uh, a lot of uh, the uh, evidence that is generated for rare diseases is carried forward from Western medicine. And we do not have our own epidemiological studies or uh, our own databases to be able to understand what our populations are going through and what is really affecting them. How can we do this? And somebody did talk about digital and digital is now exploding uh, in the rest of the world as well as in India. Mobile phone access is um, you know, very high in our country, but are we using this uh, to the advantage of the patient populations? Are we sending simple messages to them saying, hey, if you have this, maybe you need to go to your nearest doctor and have a, dis a discussion with that person. I don't think we are doing this. And this is because everything works in silos in our country. There is no integrated approach uh, as far as rare diseases is concerned. And rare diseases is still seen on, as a vertical silo. It is not integrated into the public health system. And then of course, the treat, difficult to, uh, difficulty to treat because of multidisciplinary teams that are needed. Most hospitals are in cities uh, that are uh, either in tier one or uh, metropolitan. And uh, therefore the ability for uh, patients and families to travel and spend long amounts of time or multiple visits is almost impossible. So there is no mechanism to be able to motivate those patients to come to this. And having worked in say National Vector Bond Disease Program where this ability to be able to support transportation of patients, um, you know, trans uh, transform the ability of people to come to these uh, centers, maybe some of those lessons that are already there in other public health programs in the country can be taken as uh, um, examples that can uh, then lead to uh, better access for patients with rare diseases. So if you can do it for malaria, if you can do it for tu tuberculosis, if you can do it for Kalaza, why can't we do it for rare diseases and help people to reach the centers for treatment as well as for diagnosis? Uh, again, difficult to manage, and uh, there are several social consequences. As I said, when, when I work with patient groups, we get SOS calls from even big cities like, say, um, you know, Chennai and Hyderabad, et cetera, saying, we are not able to get the treatment here. Can we come to Delhi or can we come to the All India Institute of Medical Sciences? Because these are seen as beacons of hope where there are people who have the ability to treat the most difficult of uh, rare diseases. And when we try and contact these clinicians, most of them are extremely supportive, but then the infrastructure to be able to manage this large burden does not exist. One aims in New Delhi cannot treat all the people in, in the country. We need more such uh, dedicated clinicians and physicians who are able to uh, offer that expertise in the rest of the country. And most importantly, difficult to pay for treatment and life support. So it's not just the treatment when they reach the hospital, but most of these rare diseases also need life support, even when they are within their homes. And there are no medicines or high or the medicines that are available are extremely high cost. 
So again, uh, when we talk of health uh, in all, we are talking of regulatory reliance, we are talking of how can we get medicines that are already available beyond the borders of this country to be registered with ease, how can we get these medicines to be available to populations? So there are many, many treatments, especially gene and cell therapy, which are currently not available in our country. Patient groups are very amalgamated. They are part of the national and international alliances and coalitions, and they hear that there are treatments and uh, other modalities in other parts of the world, but they are not there, and that gives them a lot of frustration. So when we talk of public health, how can we get this information that's already available without reinventing the wheel? And most importantly, quality of life is not a priority. So we, when we talk of public health, we are not even thinking of quality of uh, you know, life in parameters or indicators or how we measure them. Uh, so uh, some uh, uh, you know, initiatives for promoting equity for rare diseases. Um, are we really talking of universal healthcare and the sustainable development goals 2030 agenda when we talk of rare diseases? I don't think so because uh, you know, people talk of millions, we say 70 million or 90 million rare disease patients, and it is very expensive. So uh, when you talk to policymakers, you can hear the wheels turning in their heads, 70 million into so many crores, and we don't have the money. But um, look at it from the uh, lens of say non-communicable diseases. So when you have 25 million diabetics or 70 million uh, hypertensives, we don't say all of them are going to need a bypass surgery or all of them are going to end up with a stroke and, and will need some kind of me mechanical thrombectomy, which is very, very expensive. You talk of pre prevention and you talk it at the baseline or the grassroots. Why can't we look at rare diseases from the universal healthcare agenda and start talking about how can we use the resources that we already have to the best use instead of saying, no, this is something that is very expensive and we cannot really look at it from a public health lens. Um, a lot of uh, discussion has already happened on research and data collection, and we do know that there was, um, you know, a registry that was initiated a few years back that has not really seen much traction. Um, I heard about Kerala doing something. I really hope that this becomes a reality and that we have the evidence and the epidemiology to be able to make some quick decisions. And then promoting equity in care. So when we, when we talk of um, several public health uh, problems, like say HIV, uh, the community came together to be able to discuss and dialogue with policymakers saying, if we make a referral, they have to be given special uh, attention. Can the, uh, can the patient community in rare diseases come together and work out some kind of a system where we say, if we refer a patient to a particular center, can our referral be given some kind of priority so that that person gets uh, attention instead of waiting in long lines? And when we talk of equity, we also know that most of healthcare, especially the indoor, happens within the private sector where people have to pay out of pocket. How can we then promote equity in the private sector? Can there be a public-private uh, you know, partnership model where private sector is invited to partner with the government so that uh, a little bit of access uh, difficulty is eased and the burden of uh, accessing healthcare becomes a little lesser for the dead, uh, rare disease community. And then, of course, increasing healthcare workforce diversity. This has been a problem uh, from the public health lens for all uh, diseases, not just rare diseases. We are very, very clinician centric and we don't like to move the you know, needle of power from the clinician to the other healthcare specialities or even develop those uh, you know, alternate uh, roles and responsibilities. We do not have anything that goes beyond just the doctor, physician or uh, the, the nurse, the pharmacist, et cetera. We need to develop alternate healthcare workforce so that uh, the large population of rare disease patients are able to um, access healthcare without really waiting for a doctor's appointment. And then most importantly, influencing the determinants of health and voicing and model modeling commitment to health equity. So having a national policy for rare diseases which, which does not have any outlay for finance is not going to help the rare disease community unless you know there is some um, you have to put the money where the promise is. So unless there is some kind of um, ability to pay for most of these rare diseases, it is going to be extremely difficult for the rare disease community to have any hope in the future. So that was the last part of my slide. I tried to uh, restrict, but I still have gone beyond time. So thank you so much for giving the opportunity once again. 
thank you ma'am uh, you were actually within your uh, time schedule but it was definitely very enlightening talk that you gave especially the equity of rare disorders which is something which the policy makers have to finally take a call where do we stand today right and moving forward so yes it was very very interesting and i'm sure the audience did like that as well so thank you so much for your talk now we move on to the last uh, panelist who is an industry expert um, dr narendra chirmule he is the ceo of symphony tech biologics and former head of r and d biocon uh, Dr. Chirmule is the co-founder and CEO of Symphony Tech Biologics, a data analytics company focused on engineering solutions to biology. Also, he's a former head of R&D at Biocon in Bangalore. He has held leadership positions in Amgun and Merck vaccines to biopharmaceuticals. Dr. Chirmule is also on the NIH Advisory Committee for HIV Vaccines. He's a TEDx speaker and has recently published a book Good Genes Gone Bad by Penguin Press, both of which describe lessons learned from colossal failures in drug development. So Dr. Chirmule, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I will share my slides. Um, it's been a very enlightening last uh, an hour and a half from all the previous speakers, and I've learned a lot. And I want to especially thank Mohua, who I've been working with uh, for the last six months or so, trying to understand the landscape of um, rare diseases in India. Um, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go quickly um, and uh, we'll see if we can have more time for panel discussion. So one of the points I wanted to make is that um, when we compare ourselves in India to, to let's say United States or rest of the world, uh, we, we are, it's great to see this group of people working on rare diseases. Just to put it in perspective, in the United States, the Orphan Drug Act was, was passed in 1983. So they've had a much longer head start of trying to coordinate everything with rare diseases. So the US law provides three incentives. For, uh, I was asked by Mahar to speak on um, the, the, how the industry, especially in India, um, sees rare diseases and how, how drug development decisions are made uh, for rare diseases. Um, so the US law provides three incentives, three major incentives. One is a seven year market exclusivity, uh, a tax credit, um, and an incentive to get research grants for doing clinical studies. Um, with those kind of incentives, just as a perspective, there are almost 700 odd uh, requests for rare disease applications every year in the United States. So 700 uh, companies, at least 700 drugs are being requested to be developed every year. That's a very large amount for the last several decades now. And this, is, this slide just shows an example of the kind of companies that are working, small and large, uh, on, uh, on orphan drug rare diseases. Uh, if, you, if you look at the list of all the drugs that are published, but that are approved by the FDA every year, I can make a very long list. I will leave these five, um, uh, five drugs that were approved last year. Remember, despite COVID, um, these five drugs were approved last year for rare diseases. Um, the worldwide sales for uh, rare diseases by 2024 is uh, anticipated to be somewhere in the $200 billion. Um, the last one, for example, hemophilia A and B, Hemlibra. I personally, my very dear friend, Murli, who has hemophilia is benefiting enormously from Hemlibra directly. So I have personal contact uh, with someone who has who's taking drugs, uh, a rare disease drug. So this is my main slide for the presentation. I was asked to speak, what, what are the incentives for pharmaceutical companies, uh, both here and the United States, to develop drugs for orphan diseases? The first one I can think of is the obvious one, to provide treatment for desperately ill patients. Um, most times, there's very little competition. Uh, as I told you before, long patent protection of, uh, uh, is provided by authorities. Orphan drugs often carry high price tags because of their rare nature and lack of competition. Um, there's a potential to achieve 
fairly high IRR rates uh, that are return of investments um, from rare diseases. Uh, and one, the, the, the next one is an interesting one. The orphan disease indication, this is more on the science side, the orphan drug indication provides scientific insight into the mechanism of disease pathogenesis. For example, if there is a drug like IL-4 receptor, which is being used for ultimately treating asthma, before you start developing the drug for asthma, um, you could test it for another rare lung disease indication like lung inflammation. And if anti-IL-4 IL antibody has an impact on rare diseases, the likelihood that it will have an impact on asthma also is high. So this is how this, the, this is how the development strategy is used uh, in, in pharmaceutical companies. And finally, faster approval time uh, for the rare disease is a very big incentive. Uh, and there is a phenomenon in, in the US called the voucher system, which I won't have time today to go over detail, but if there are questions, I can explain that a little bit more in detail. Uh, some interesting facts about rare disease and pharmaceutical companies, uh, and this is from a Harvard Business Review article, uh, stock prices of companies increased by at least 3.3% after announcement of raw, uh, orphan drug disease uh, approval. And then another one, which is a very counterintuitive, but true, but through analysis, um, companies with orphan drug market authorization are more profitable and are more attractive investment opportunities than non-orphan drug companies. And this may, be, this may have many reasons. Uh, the financial one is the obvious one, but the compassion, the compassion of the company to be able to develop drugs for rare diseases goes a long way in, in uh, you know, demonstrating that the company really means um, to treat, build drugs for patients. So I'll stop here. And um, maybe if there are questions, I can take questions in more detail um, in lieu of time. Uh, so back to you, Anjali. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chirmale. I think this was uh, the most quick presentation and I think very informative. Thank you so much for keeping within your time limit. Thank you. Um, that was very informative. Um, in the interest of time, I think we will be skipping the, um, uh, the open floor discussion upon, among the panelists and we will be quickly moving on to the Q&A. But before Q&A, we would request Dr. Prashant Srinivas to summarize the discussions of the four panelists in your own words and maybe uh, it would help the audience also to understand in terms of a summary, what best we could take it from there for the Q&A. Thank you. Sure, sure. Um, in the interest of time, and like Dr. Chirmule said, so that we can we can have some uh, discussion on this, I'll be brief and I will not attempt being too comprehensive. Uh, so pardon me if I miss some of the points. So we started with uh, uh, Dr. Dhawan's uh, presentation main takeaway is expanding access to clinical trials in the interest of equity and removing uh, policy barriers uh, for that to happen, more collaborative and interdisciplinary thinking. And an important point, although said very briefly, the fact that for universal health coverage uh, to be achieved, so we need to cover rare diseases. She mentioned health insurance, but health insurance is one way, but how do we attempt, uh, how do we move towards universal health coverage where rare disease is an important component of uh, UHC? Uh, of course, there was a lot more information on uh, from the perspective of muscular dystrophies um, also. Um, then uh, I'll, I'll skip mine and I'll come to that at the end. From Dr. Singh, uh, we learned uh, some amazing uh, efforts by the system uh, in the form of the RBSK program of the government of India, which has been able to bring in newborn screening that can cover a large spectrum of rare diseases, even if not all. Um, and I think this is commendable because uh, uh, wherever uh, a program works through community health workers like ASHA, ANMs, et cetera, it works everywhere in the country because that system touches everyone, uh, most people, let's say, at least. Uh, so that was a very imp important uh, input. And, uh, and I think RBSK is a great entry point for the rare disease uh, community to be able to impact very large number of people. And of course, there was a very interesting um, example of Kerala that uh, he presented. So from that, I again highlight the importance of governance. I think the importance of uh, political state and administrative will to implement such a program, I think mattered uh, in, in securing very good outcomes there. Uh, 
uh, I'm sure. But uh, so that that was that. From Dr. Ratna Devi, uh, I, I really commend uh, the wide systems view. And I think to some extent, because she spoke from the patient perspective, I think uh, she brought in what doctors and scientists Im importantly miss because doctors and scientists tend to completely stick to the clinical and medical or the scientific viewpoint, whereas the social consequences, the rural urban divide, the lack of integration, um, the lack of focus on quality and quality of life and quality of care, because rare disease is not only about diagnosis and therapeutics, it's also about the quality of life that these people are able to live. And more importantly, the clinician-centric solutions, I think that really touched uh, an important note. So when we talk of solutions in public health, we tend to focus it around doctors largely, but sometimes also about nurses. But healthcare, uh, as we know, is much wider than doctors and nurses. And she brought in financing. So that's what I like about her presentation, which covered uh, uh, the system, the rare disease, the entire rare disease uh, health uh, ecosystem. Um, and finally, Dr. Chirmule's important points on how to leverage industry to invest more in rare disease, because this is not only about patients and access, it's also about new therapeutics, new innovations and new technologies. Um, I'll, I've already made, had uh, enough of my time, so I'll, I'll just say my uh, presentation's main message was that equity is more than rich and poor. We'll need to also keep in mind various other axes of inequities, including gender, disability, caste, uh, um, urban and rural location, and of course, rich and poor. So with this, I hand back uh, to the moderator and hopefully in the next 15 minutes, uh, we can also try to have some directed uh, interaction and questions. And apologies if I missed something, I was not attempting to be comprehensive. <laughs> Oh, no, thank you, Dr. Prashant. That was pretty comprehensive and it was summarized really, really well. Thank you so much. Uh, so as, as I said, in the interest of time, we are skipping the open flow thematic discussions and we are moving quickly to the Q&A session. I hand over the floor to Mahua now to take the Q&A from the audience and uh, we can then uh, get it addressed quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anjali, Anjali, and thank you to all the speakers. It was an extremely immersive session. And uh, in interest of uh, time, we have skipped uh, one of the round, but it's fine. We will answer, uh, get the answers to the questions here. So, yeah, so I think uh, I'll direct my first question uh, to Dr. Arun. Uh, the question is asked by uh, Dr. Sudha Bhattacharya. And uh, Madam Vita is, is with us. So the question is, how was your screening program helped to increase? How have your screening uh, program helped to increase the diagnosis of rare diseases? Can it be used to obtain an estimate of disease prevalence? Yeah, so, over to Dr. Rita. Yeah, so very correctly, there are two things we need to understand. What is the starting point of a rare disease? See, once the rare disease has been diagnosed, then it is much easier to go about whether the treatment exists, where the treatment exists, where to refer. What should be the starting point? So there are two kinds of broadly groups. One, which is very obvious right at the system where anyone with some knowledge can diagnose. So this is one group. The second is even as a diagnostic dilemma. But there is a point here. Even if it is a diagnostic dilemma, that child will not behave like any other child. So we'll either have some problem in neuromotor, in speech and something. Such children, they are referred to the early intervention center. And if you focus from them, and it may take them some time. So they then can be even the rarest of the rare you can find in that group. So the screening definitely tells you two things. One, what you could not diagnose, but the child appeared to be not behaving their normal. And one, there is a straightforward diagnosis. But newborn screening is an opportunity which should not be missed because every child, the parents want to know if my child is normal or not. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. That was a very uh, comprehensive and articulate answer. I hope Dr. Sudha has uh, got her answer. Uh, Dr. Sudha is uh, one of the leading rare disease advocate and a very eminent scientist. Uh, she has another question uh, for Dr. Nadine. Uh, so I would request our uh, team to uh, kindly uh, give her uh, the mic uh, and uh, so that she can come live and uh, quickly uh, ask a question. So uh, by the time that is done, maybe I'll take um, another question. Um, 
uh, that is for Dr. Ratna. Uh, someone, um, uh, so it, this question is from Diksha and she wants to know how to calculate a rare disease incidence using retrospective data. Thank you, Mahua. I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person to be answering this question because I don't do research. Maybe you can uh, direct it to somebody who does epidemiological studies. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, Dr. Prashant, uh, would you like to take this up? Uh, sorry, could you please repeat, Mahua? I was trying to put... Yeah, so how to calculate a rare disease incidence using retrospective data? Um, Maybe I'll combine a bit uh, also the previous question that uh, that uh, that Dr. Singh already answered just to supplement that and this question. Um, retrospective data will have to exist on rare diseases and routine program data, as many of you will know, is is a challenge in India. Uh, health is also health and healthcare. We must remember is a state subject, so that's also another big barrier for central policy makers because health and healthcare are organized slightly differently, although there are very important national uh, missions. So uh, routine data, wherever data is good, and if it does capture uh, rare diseases, uh, then it can be used. Uh, in Karnataka, I can say, uh, uh, among all the rare diseases, um, I don't think routine health department data captures it. There are expert centers uh, in, in Bangalore uh, whose routine data might capture it. And in that instance, retrospective data can be used but it will obviously not uh, give a population level estimate. It will still remain a hospital uh, based uh, estimate, uh, which is which is a good starting point. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Uh, uh, so I answer to this. Yes, yes, Dr. Arun, please go ahead. So the point is that if we screen all children, so say a child has been born in a village in Karnataka. Now the rare disease was diagnosed when it was, he is in Delhi. All we require is two data. The year in which he was born and the place in which he is born because the denominator needs to be the number of children born in that district, not hospital. If I know that in five years back, so many children were born in that, then I can of course track. So all you have to do is whenever you diagnose a disease, go back to his date of birth, go back to the place where he was born and put that data there. So it is a dynamic data and it will tell you the incidence because you have a denominator number of children born and the child. That's it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Narun. Uh, so I think Dr. Sudha, uh, you can turn on your video and kindly ask question to Dr. Nar Naray. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sudha. Yeah, please go ahead and ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes, Dr. Sudha, okay. you are perfect. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists. This was really very revealing and educational for me since I've entered this space recently. Uh, so Dr. Arun, thanks for answering my question. Actually, my concern was a little bit that, you know, since you're doing this really excellent program, uh, almost like door-to-door -door survey of, uh, you know, babies who have some, uh, some feature which, Sort of uh, so my idea was that if you can make it a quantitative thing, then, uh, you know, one problem is in rare disease space is that the government always says, where are the people, where is the data? So you are uh, anyway doing it, uh, you know, for your own study, but if it could be uh, made quantitative, then we could also come out with numbers, even if we don't have a diagnosis as such, but we know that these are the potential even that I think would be a very valuable uh, information and data. Sure. Uh, Dr. Sudha, um, sorry, uh, if Dr. Arun was answering the question. No, no, I just said, yeah. That's okay, sure. Point. Okay, so Dr. Sudha, could you please go ahead with your question to Dr. Naren? Yeah, Dr. Naren, thank you very much. Uh, so we, as uh, rare disease, uh, you know, patients, uh, people suffering from rare disease really look forward to uh, the companies, uh, you know, like bio and other very progressive companies to come forward with uh, helping out in developing the technology platforms. You know, like uh, say if we have a gene therapy or gene editing platform developed in the country, then uh, it can really benefit a large number of uh, patients uh, because it, it is more like a, a platform technology. 
So uh, why is it that we hardly see any such initiative coming from uh, you know the pharma companies? Uh, I can understand that you know there are a lot of initial hitches, but uh, is it, do you think the time is now ripe for pharma companies to somehow be lured into this uh, so that they can join forces with researchers and clinicians to uh, make it possible in India? As you know, the drug pricing is so high that even if a drug is available, we cannot afford it in India. So I would like to know your views on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. And I'm going to try to see if I can answer it succinctly. Um, but I'll give you a little bit of a perspective of an answer before I come to answer the rare diseases. And um, one point I will make, uh, not even rare diseases, just regular novel drug drugs for large indication diseases are not being developed in India. Very few companies are developing drugs for novel drug discovery, not even rare. So rare to baad mein aayega. So I'll just tell you a little bit of a perspective of why that is the case, right? I think the risk, um, ability to take risks in India by the pharmaceutical company is very low. So we started off in 2000s by, take, by making generic drugs, which is, you know, basically drugs that have gone out of patent and we became really good at it. 40% of the drugs in the world are sold by companies made, by, made in India. Then the next decade became the drugs for making biosimilars, which are sort of the generic versions of biologics. And we became in the next decade from 2010 to 20, we are now becoming very good at making biologics. Now we will start maybe making novel drugs because I think now we have become very good at understanding how to make biologics. Now we, from 2021, we will start making novel molecules. I think rare disease have to wait another 10 years. Hopefully not, <laughs> but the way I give the analogy is genetics, we, the pharmaceutical industry in India was in elementary school. Uh, by law, by, biosimilars, we went to, let's say, high school. Uh, now we are in college. Uh, PhD to rare disease baad nahi aega. College ke baad hi aega. <laughs> so do you think we've now entered college? <laughs> Have we now entered college? Baad mein PhD karenge. I'm being a little... Dr. Narendra, I have just had a follow-up question. Uh, there, there are a lot of molecules that can be repurposed. Why is the Indian pharma not looking at repurposing? That is not new molecules. Well, I think this requires a much more detailed discussion. Um, and and maybe maybe I will take the example for just take take the example with you. I know Dr. Arun Singh, uh, uh, Anjali or Mohua. How much time do we have? Because I want to indulge Ratna with a question. Yeah. Please, please go ahead. We'll we'll take the liberty to you know just extend our time a little bit. We, our apologies to the audience, but yeah, please go ahead. Okay, Ratna. Let's say you own a company. Okay, um, developing a drug for a rare disease is going to cost you let's say hundred crore. Okay. Um, I we, I understand the philosophy, sir. I I still ask you that answer, question. Answer. I'm going to answer you. You're going to answer your own question in a minute. Uh, <laughs> so you're, you're going to invest 100 crore of your own money or your investors' money and develop the drug, right? Um, for the rare disease, will you invest 100 crore? No. There, they have already had the answer. I hope, was hoping you would say yes, at least at this first question. But if you had said yes. No, I but I, I have an answer to that, which means there has to be a publicly funded mechanism for them. No, you know uh, no it's public. not an investor money if it is not an investor money it has to be some other source that is investing into it but we cannot say because we don't have the 100 crores we cannot have an answer to it the definition of industry if you want to pure play pure play definition of industry it is invest and returns of investment that is what industry does right you know there's compassion and all that csr money all of that we can talk separately but pure if you want just pure investment Red disease, I would rather make a baniya ki dukaan. Paan shab mein jada paisa mil jayega mulega se paisa hi banana hai to, right? But there has to be passion. And so Ratna, one, the follow-up question if you had said yes, was I would have said that you're going to invest 100 crore, but your return is going to be only one crore. So will you accept the loss? No pharmaceutical industry will accept this loss unless there is a different mechanism of doing things. What India, I'm talking in generic terms, what India has been very good at over the last three decades, I would say, is jump, uh, doing a leapfrog on technologies. We've leapfrogged the phone technology. We've leapfrogged um, the uh, FinTech, the financial technology. Every Everybody has a UPI on their phone. 
we've completely um, bypassed the requirement of everybody having a bank. I think the healthcare sector of being, giving access to healthcare is going to be that leapfrog. I don't know what that innovation is going to be, but there's definitely going to be a leapfrog. And why can't we have sub-licensing arrangements or knowledge transfer arrangements? I mean, it works in other uh, sections of red, um, of healthcare. Why is it not working for rare diseases? Sorry, I'm, I'm posing all these questions. No, no, I'm happy to discuss. You know, I can I can give you answers to many of these answers. But Mohua and uh, Anjali, do you want us to continue or? <laughs> I mean, maybe a quick, you know, just to answer to this and then maybe we'll move towards wrapping up okay, this session. Okay, licensing, you know, I, there are many, many reasons, Ratna. There's, it can't be like one reason, right? Like, let's say, for example, even CAR T cells, just say, let's say CAR T cells, which you probably are familiar with, right? Yeah. Um, in the US, if you go and if you get it, uh, if you get uh, CAR T cell therapy, it will cost you, let's say, $200,000, which is sort of about a crore, two crore, something like that, right? If, let's say, company which is selling car, selling a drug at two, two crore in the US suddenly start selling it here for two lakhs, right? They will have inequity in explaining to their their uh, process, why is it costing two lakhs here and 200 crore or, or, or two crore there? I mean, that is one of the one of the explanations why companies don't come here and, and, and have licensing agreements. I can, let me stop here. <laughs> we definitely look forward to having another discussion on innovative finance, financing mechanism for rare disease drugs. Uh, if it would have been possible, we would have started right away uh, with all the charged up panelists right at this moment. But in lieu of time, I would like to end the session here. Thank you all the panelists for this extraordinary session, this engaging discussion. And thank you for the enthusiastic participants who have been with us for all this time and uh, for amazing questions, posing amazing questions. We thank uh, Ashoka University, our partner institute in organizing this event. And this is just the end of day one. Tomorrow again, 9.30 a.m. Uh, we have another very interesting session waiting for us. Uh, that would be on rare disease registry. We would see how to strengthen rare disease registries in India. So I would request all our uh, uh, enthusiastic participants to please join tomorrow again, and we'll have, uh, we can promise we will have another big session. Uh, right. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Yes, please join. Uh, just for the intervention. Uh, so I think most of the questions were also pouring in. There were also some for Dr. Josna Dhawan. I think we can take them offline. We can send them right. over the mail and get them addressed because they were, I saw on the chat box, there were a lot of questions for Dr. Dhawan. And right. uh, since it has been there in the in the question Q and A panel, so why not get it addressed offline sure. through the uh, yes uh, email mode? Yes, right. Yes. So questions to even thanks Anjali for bringing that up. Questions to other panelists also. We will direct it to them, and we definitely uh, look forward to having answers to all the questions. So thank you, everyone. I would request the panelists to stay back for a group photograph. Uh, so please switch on uh, your cameras, everyone, and we'll take a quick photograph. Thank you, all the audience. Looking forward to meeting you tomorrow again. So uh, do we have everyone? Uh, I'd request the team to take the pictures. I'd request uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Alok Bhattacharya, Professor Sashidhara, Dr. Sudha Bhattacharya to come in as well. Yeah, I think Dr. Josna Dhawan is uh, still there. Yeah, Dr. Josna Dhawan, we would kindly request you to kindly switch on your video and yeah, okay, let's see. Yeah. So one of our team members, maybe Saikat, uh, can you please start taking the pictures? Dr. Jyotna is not here, I suppose. I think he yeah. just left. Yeah, I think we can click the picture because she just said. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, okay. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Is it taken? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, picture taken. Thank you, all the panelists again. It was a wonderful, amazing session. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you to the thank entire so team much. for helping us organizing this. Yes, Dr. thanks Dr. to the Dr. Dr. Momita, Yeah, yes. thank you, Anjali. Thank you so much. And we look forward to also having you on board tomorrow. Do yes. attend tomorrow's session, please. Please, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.
shall we end up yes